Yeah, I am now. All right, go ahead. Don't worry about it. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, I'm Gerald Moy, a guy who goes to the old world class recognizer to introduce So Bobby Hopkins. And now to introduce your host, Gerald A. K. A. A. Cole. And across the ring, introducing Money Rich. And now, Ladies and gentlemen, it's called the car. Time to tune in. Where you go, Cole? Right here. All right. Good morning, everyone. It's another episode of uh, the Soap Boxing Podcast. It's your boy, Manny Fresh, and Coach is uh, somewhere. Where did he I'm go? I'm getting that IG live on. No, All right. Well, we are excited to have uh, our guest in today. Go ahead, Coach. Introduce her. Jenny, this is uh well I don't really know your background other than other than you I know Darwin, I know you uh fought Marlene a couple times, beat at the end as an amateur. I know yep. uh I know you're uh representing the the the, the country is it flyweight? Flyweight. Flyweight, flyweight yeah. Uh what else? Uh, somebody yeah, told me you went to LSU, huh? Yeah, I'm a Tiger. Go Tigers. Uh. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> what, uh, but yeah, you, you, are you originally from uh, Galveston? Where are you from? No, no, no. I'm originally from Houston, Texas. Okay. Um, my family has just moved down to Kima, kind of Galveston mm. area. So when I come back home, from Colorado Springs, like you know, I, that's why I'm down in Kima all the time. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, did you run? Uh, was you what you was doing at LSU? Was, you was playing. So something. yeah, so I would I was a walk on on the cross country and track team at LSU. Okay, okay. Mm-hmm. And tell how we got started in boxing. So I actually got started at LSU. Um, my sophomore year in college. I actually wasn't running for LSU at the time. And I'll tell you the story. I ended up getting kicked off the team for a prank I did. Um, All I did was break down my friend's door to his room because his roommate bet me a hundred bucks that I couldn't do it. And because it was destruction of school property, I got kicked off for that. But that was a blessing in disguise because then that kind of uh, took me on my path to boxing because I eventually met a professional boxer down in Baton Rouge. We became really good friends. I watched him train and I was like, I want to, you know, I need to get back into something. Um, you know, I've been an athlete all my life. I've done all sports. I was like, I want to try boxing. I never tried boxing. So he took me to where he starts an amateur boxer. And I, you know, I just fell in love with it immediately. And I picked it up real fast. The coach there said, I see a lot of potential in you. Do you want to train to fight? And I was like, yep, let's do this. So I started training to fight. And in 2010, I went to my uh, first national tournament, which was the Women Golden Gloves. And that's when they announced that the IOC was putting women boxing in the Olympics. And I always wanted to go for running. But I obviously knew I didn't have the talent for running. And I was like, oh, my God, this is my opportunity to get to the Olympics. So... From then on, you know, I looked at my coach and said, let's do it. And so I dedicated my time to that. I graduated from LSU in 2011, moved back to Houston. And that's where I met Derwin. And I worked with him for a couple of weeks, uh, ended up going to another gym and working with Roy Alvarado, um, who I don't know if you guys know. I worked with him for a good while for like, Three years almost. And then he had some personal issues. So then I went back to Derwin and I've been working with Derwin since. Who, 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 uh, let's backtrack a second. Who, who did you start working with in, in Louisiana? Um, his name is D- Dave Pichon out of okay. Breck Boxing Gym. In Baton Rouge? In Baton Rouge, yeah. Okay. And, and how long did you, how long were you doing that? So, I started training with him in 2008. 
of like April of 2008. And then I graduated in 2011. And he actually, so when I graduated in 2011, I moved back home to Houston, but the nationals were that June. So he came out there to Colorado Springs for the national tournament to help my corner. And that was the last time I worked with David um, because, you know, because he was in Baton Rouge and I was in Houston now, so I had to find a coach. But he helped me for that nationals. Okay. Uh, yeah. And so you came here and you got with uh, uh, no, I don't, I don't think I recognize who you, Alvarado. Roy Alvarado. Yeah. Um, I, may, I might do. I just ain't, ain't remembering his face or something. Yeah, he uh, he was uh wor- working out of the same gym as Rudy, and um, I used to in fact spar Marlin back in the day. Before, okay. you know, before I kind of started getting my name known, I used to spar her all the time. At which gym? At which gym? And it was it was elite. It was elite boxing off of I-10. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, but now, you know, he's gone to, he's changed gyms. And Roy's now, he's not, he's not coaching anymore. Okay. So that's why I went back to Derwin, because I met Derwin. Because I, when I first moved, I went to Jay's, Jay Prince's gym, and was working okay. with Johnson. And that's where I met Derwin, and they were kind of both helping me out. Um, but I ended up going to Elite because I had met one of the coaches at Nationals and said, you should come and spar Marlin to get good sparring. Because I was trying to qualify for the 2012 Olympic trials. Uh-huh. And I had lost my first fight at Nationals, and I had two, chance, two other chances to qualify, which was the Golden Gloves and the Pals. So he was, he was telling me to go over there and – and get some good sparring to try to qualify. And um, that's where I met Roy Alvarado. And we just had a good connection. I liked what he was teaching me. So I ended up staying with him. Um, and he, you know, he got me far. He did a lot. He did a lot with me. So I give him a lot of credit for, you know, the boxer that I am today. Man, you, uh, you're deeply I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't have a. Uh, have a relationship with nothing with Derwin, but I know him and he, he's a great guy. Uh, yeah. And that's, that's how I know. That's how I know of you, you know, through Derwin's uh, yeah. working with him. But, yeah, he's uh, great. I love Derwin. Yeah, real good guy, man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, D, so, you so go ahead, man. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I can hear okay. Hey, you're so you're deeply you're deeply rooted in in the uh, in the Houston community, man. You named all these names from Johnson to Rudy. Right. Uh, you know, you when you fought in Golden Gloves, you fought you when you won the Golden Gloves, you won in Louisiana, right? Was the Louisiana yeah, I, I've, won the, I've won the Louisiana Golden Gloves twice, I think. Yeah, so I pretty much fought all the all the ladies in Louisiana, and that's another reason why I moved back to Houston because I was like, all right, there's no one to no one for me to fight here. Let me move on back home to Texas. And so you came <laughs> back and you started and you started sparring Marlene. Yeah, for now, how- yeah the first couple of, uh, I guess the first good almost year back in Houston, I was sparring her a lot. How did that feel some kind of Houston? How did you feel about that? Because you went out and you beat her, I think, what, three times? Yeah. So, you know, like that's how our history started. Um, I, you know, like I was training at the same gym. We were sparring back in the day and then I qualified for the tr- for the 2012 trials. So me and Roy kind of got pushed out of the gym because of that because uh, I don't think anybody expected that so you know Roy was like you know everybody this is everybody has a chance to get that spot for the Olympics so you know let's go for it so he actually um, I was actually training out of his garage for a long time he like cleaned it out made it made it a whole little boxing gym and so I trained out of there I mean for almost two years I feel like um Ooh. And then, you know, we would just go from gym to gym in Houston to get sparring. And I would spar in there. His son, uh, his son was actually a really good boxer. And I would spar him and his daughter. So I would spar them in the in the in the garage. I got a lot of good work in there. Those were some good days. <laughs> Wherever there's gloves and, and some space. We, we right. Box. Exactly. He, he made it perfect. It was a nice little gym. You you and so you won multiple tournaments and now you were on your path to 2020 in, in Tokyo, huh? Yep, still and am. Well, 2021 now. What? So they they rescheduled it. Yeah, they they just pushed it back a year. 
And so how pretty much the same dates. How has that affected? How has that affected your training this year and what and, and your mindset moving into that? Well, I mean, of course, it's frustrating. I thought I'd be heading to Tokyo right now because we were going to go early to do a three week camp. But, you know, like this coronavirus is out of anybody's control. So, you know, like I'm trying not to get mad or or stuck on that, you know, like, oh, my God, I'm supposed to be in the Olympics now. So, I mean, I just it's honestly given me another year just to get better and to get more better prepared for getting the gold medal. So that's how I'm looking at it. And and I'm always looking at it like it's 2019 and instead of 2020. Hmm. Kind of trick in my mind. An extra year in there. Yeah. Who uh your first your your first trip uh up to Colorado Springs, who did you uh jail with as far as coaches up there? I like to ask everybody, all the amateurs, you know, about their experience on the national team and which trainers have uh gave you know, left an impression. On well, them. When I first went to camp there, that was when USA Boxing was like, you know, I think the president had just got fired. We didn't have a head coach. Um, so they were just bringing in random coaches. But uh, that was the very, very first time I went there. Then the second time I went there, we had Pedro as the head coach from Cuba. Okay. You remember when he was the head coach? Yeah. And, and yeah, I love Pedro. He was a great coach. And he, he you know, he was great with the team, with all the athletes. Um, I liked his workouts and everything. So it was kind of a shame that um, he had to leave. He was a great coach. So, but when I when I moved down there in two thousand six or in two thousand fifteen, after winning the trials, right? Um, I'd say the the coach that gets along with all the athletes and supports them and is a great trainer is K K Karoma. Um, he was a, he was a great coach and, and still, you know, he knows how to run a program like that and how to keep the athletes thirsty and motivated. Yeah. He's a good guy. Ain't he? He's a good guy. <laughs> yeah. I like him a lot too. Uh, <clears throat> so I, I think it's kind of obvious that you and, uh, Michaela are best friends, huh? <laughs> Oh. A little bit, huh? I can't stand her, but yeah, we're best friends. <laughs> when did I? When did y'all meet? The first time you went up there, or what? Fifteen? So, what, what no. So the first time I met her was in 2010 at the Na Women's National Golden Gloves, my first national tournament. Yeah, um, I remember. I was. I went out. To, it was in uh, Hollywood Beach, like in, near Miami. And I went out there to sit on the by the beach and I saw her running and like shadow boxing. And I'm like, oh, hey, there's another white girl here. <laughs> I was like, what's up? So another, that's how another I, minority. Yeah. Another minority, exactly. So that's how I met her. And then um I lost she had lost and I lost in the finals. And then, you know, we like just like hung out after the tournament and became really good friends and Ever since then, when we would go to national tournaments, we would just room together, you know, to save money and all that. Right. And that's where our, that's where our friendship started. And we were we've kind of been on the same journey together too. Like we uh, both qualified for the 2012 Olympic trials, both lost. Then 2016 came. You know, all those those four years in between, we we busted our ass. And I, you know, I was always number two. I'd always lose to Marlin, but. I was right there on the cusp. You know, I always thought I won most of those, you know, um, but I always lost on split decision. And then when the 2016 Olympic trials came, we both won it, you know, so it's, it's kind of, we've kind of been on this road together. And even though I didn't, even though I didn't get to Rio to compete, you know, I got to go with the team and support and, and experience it and everything. So I yeah, I've known you, her I think uh, it's a very valuable uh, commodity to have a, a friend like that. Uh, like for your pro, for your pro, she's going through it. She's doing yeah. it. So I'm sure y'all, you know, you get to say, "Hey, how's this? What's this? What's going on?" Living that, living that, deal with her. So for when it's your yeah. turn, uh, you know, you you have a a, a 
a fullback blocking for the running back <laughs> coming up. Yeah. You can see the thing. You can see what's going on. You know. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I've been with. I've been from the start of her pro career. I've kind of been with her and seen how you know how it works and how different it is from the amateurs. And I'm right. lucky to see that because you're right. When, when I turn pro, I know what to expect. Right. It's a. It's a. It's a. It's it's such a uh, different atmosphere that oh, yeah. uh, that. Having that, having a, a friend like that is is valuable. I would, yeah. I would imagine. I would imagine. Yeah, and same with Clarissa, and same, you know, um, cause she she's like she's like my sister too. You talking about and you talking about the goat, right? I'm talking about the goat. <laughs> yep. Yes, That's sir. Right. Yeah, I know. I and know one, her. One of the uh, <laughs> one one of the things that Coach and I are always uh, discussing is the the age that people start boxing. You know, there's no, there's been a a theory that you know the, the younger they start the better but we've seen and noticed that over the years as as people are starting boxing the older that you know they might have a little more advantage if, if they're a little more grown how how was it for you transitioning from one sport to another and uh how how do you feel that's helped you starting to get a, a little later stay uh start in boxing i actually totally agree with you guys because like I've been an athlete all my life and I've done all sports, team sports, individual sports, but I started running like and started my running career in middle school. So I could feel like by the time I got to college, you know, still, I still had a passion for it, but I almost kind of, I could kind of feel myself kind of getting burned out from all the miles. You know, I was running 60 miles a week in high school. Um, Right. And I see that in boxers that start when they're eight years old. And now that are my age, like they still have the passion love for it, but their body's just kind of burnt out. And so that's why I'm glad I started at 21 years old because, you know, I'm still, still pretty fresh. I feel like in the game, only 10 years when people are almost 20 years. So I'm not even close to being burnt out. Um, and I think that's, I have an advantage over most people because of that like you know so. with, with 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 you starting at 21 you were already an athlete and then you know you're you're, you're getting to the national tournaments you're getting to the olympics um what was what was your what was your training like and what was your mentality when you first started boxing were you one of those people that had to be in the gym three four hours a day five days six days a week how did you what was your mindset doing that? Yeah, you, I you can't you I didn't can't, I didn't want to miss it, huh? Tournament. You can't get into national tournaments just training once or twice a week. No. No, no, no. And you know, my friend who was a professional boxer, you know, he, he kind of helped me understand the game because he's one of them that started when he was eight years old. So but yeah, I was I mean, and I've always been dedicated to whatever sport I'm in. Um, but yeah, I, I showed up to the gym every day it was open. Um, try to get there early, try to be the last one to leave. And, you know, like I've never boxed before. I'm starting at 21. So I was like, okay, I got to catch up because I know these others started when they're 10, eight years old. So yeah, I, so when I was in college, it was go to class, study, box. Like I used to, you know, I went to LSU. It's a fun, good party school. So <laughs> I used to, you know, before it was boxing, I was doing a lot of that. So, but I was like, I got to cut that. I was like, I got to cut that out. Like I'm now, you know, I got to get back into this routine and especially in a weight cutting sport because I've never been a weight cutting sport. So I had to watch what I put in my body. So that was also, you know, um, another like motivation to stop all the partying in college and stuff. And so, yeah, I, that was my life. And then even when I got back to Houston, I, graduated yeah i was you know looking for jobs and putting out um applications filling out applications but i really was more focused on my boxing like i'd spend more time at the gym and be like oh maybe i'll fill out an application today <laughs> but you know i was lucky i was, able, I was lucky to be to do that because my parents supported me and had my back because they were like because they know like once i'm set out right once i have this passion i'm set out for this goal they'll know i'll do anything to get there what were they, so what they were like, this is what I want to do. I was like, this is what I want to do. And because they know my uh, dream to go to the Olympics. So they've what had my was, back. What was their reaction when you decided to go to boxing? <laughs> First of all, they were like, 
they laughed and were like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, you're going to start boxing. And I was like, no, 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 I'm serious, guys. Like, I'm training to, to get a fight. This is back in Louisiana. And so they're like, okay, so you want to be brain dead by your – by the time you're 40, I was like, no, no, listen, I'm actually really good at boxing. Cause you know, no, nobody in my family has ever been in a boxing gym or they don't really watch boxing. So, so I, my, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I'm like, I'm 21 years old, you know, I'm going to do this. They're like, yeah, you can do what you want, but you know, when you're 40 and you, you can't talk straight, well, well we're going to say, told you so. Oh. But then they came to my very second fight. And I ended up beating this girl down, made her bleed and everything. And so after I got out of the ring, my mom's like, wow, damn, you can't fight. Okay, let's do this. And then like ever <laughs> since they saw their fight, they've had my back. <laughs> awesome. Oh, yeah. We, we have a question from one of the viewers just that asked, Virginia, would you ever get into mixed martial arts if you haven't yet? Also, have you sparked any other professional mixed martial arts and how far behind do you feel these athletes are in boxing? Um, I, I've got that question before. I don't think I'm going to get an MMA, um, only because I have no training background with like judo or wrestling or all the other, um, fighting. So I, and you know, I want to go pro in boxing and I've already made that my goal and my plan. So I'm going to, I'm going to stick to that. But yeah, I've, I've sparred uh, a lot of MMA girls like Rose. I've sparred Rose. I sparred Raquel Miller. Oh. Um, and her and her wife Tisha. Uh, who I think I've sparred like a couple others, but I, the, I can't remember. They weren't like big name girls, but yeah. I, um, and I still help out uh, Raquel and Tisha because they right. live in Colorado Springs. Right, and, and, and the the interesting part of the question for me, as a trainer and not a MMA, you know, not very schooled or MMA was when he said, how far behind do you feel <laughs> the MMA girls are in boxing, behind a pure boxer? I, I just from just from a just from a, a, a me observing it, uh I don't feel like MMA guys are boxing. No. I feel like they're throwing punches and 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 because they 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 tend to hurl them shots, you know, lob them shots up from strange distance, strange range, you know, and it didn't matter if it's inside or outside, they just chunking them punches. And I don't see very much and it's a fight I like. They have MMA guys that I, I watch. You know, I'll be a fan. I just don't pretend to know what they're doing. But yeah. I, but as far as the boxing aspect, yeah, I got an opinion on that because that's what well, I'm doing. Yeah. Well most most I realize that most MMA people come from a background of wrestling or judo. It's not necessarily from boxing. And I've I had this guy who wanted me to work on his on his boxing. He was an MMA guy, and he would always get be so squared the whole time. And I was like, no, 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 get get at an angle, get at an angle. And he's like, whoa, this feels so weird because they're taught to be squared because you got to get ready for kicks, you got to get ready for takedowns because that's yeah. what they're mostly. That's how they that's what they're thinking. And that's like their training They They don't want to be like this because they're not just boxing. They got to look for everything. So that's why you probably think that way. And you see, you see them just like throwing shots and kind of wild. And, the, and, and the other thing is like, that's part of a, that's appealing to me for, and, and I see what I think people like about it is a person could box from the beginning of life, right? And still never master uh, pugilism. But but in MMA, you know, there's so many things going on. It's impossible for you to be a, uh, the best at something that's five or six things going on. So yeah. I think the part of the appeal to the, but it's not a bad thing because that's why it constantly changes. You know, somebody wins. Yeah, they'll, they'll, you know the TV will tell us. The TV will tell us. You know this guy is the best MMA fighter in the history of the sport. Four or five fights later, <laughs> somebody else done came because he offsets that. So it's almost yeah. like uh, it's it's almost like that's appealing because it really is just a a brawl, and depending on who catches who, you know uh, uh, who's gonna win. So you, it's it's really that fact of shit. As soon as you think somebody's the top guy, yeah, somebody comes up, boom, he's gone. Another guy, right. comes. 
So I, I don't feel like you can, you can, you know, I don't feel like there'll ever be a, a Joe Lewis of MMA or or, or a Floyd Mayweather. Right. 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 right, because in because in boxing, if you have one loss, you're you know that kind of like makes you like yeah. your career is not is your career is going downhill where if you have one loss of MMA that doesn't really matter you still can be on top or you can still get back on top but with boxing it's different once you have a loss it's kind of like uh you're not the you know you're not going to be you know the great you're yeah, not going to be MMA, great I I envy that in MMA too like yeah the, right the fans the fans like boys lose 10 fights you know I see from, from a boxing <laughs> standpoint I look at the record and I say Man, this dude is fifteen and eight. Yeah, what y'all mean? he's good. But exactly, I think they understand. Hey, shit happens. This is a fight. Yeah. You know, yeah. you can get choked out. You can get knocked out. You can get uh, you know, submitted, and, yeah. and 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 it doesn't necessarily mean you can't fight. You know, yeah. so so I say, I, you know, I envy that because as a kid growing up, you know, my heroes was in the early eighties and stuff, and and and. Them, they they lost a few and it didn't matter because they were fighting the best of the best. So yeah. there's no uh there's no uh shame in losing to uh, Roberto Duran and, or uh, uh or retirement hers and then you get another shot and they say you upset one of them guys, you know. So so it, the 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 sport has changed with a lot of things, but uh yeah, them MMA guys, they they fans is fanatical. Now I think the drawback to that is this. I really feel like UFC and MMA, and I could, I, I could, I don't admit it. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. So this could be wrong. It's two left shoe. I think their popularity has peaked. Like this is what it is. This is yeah. what you're gonna get. You're gonna get. Now they can, they can, they can promote a particular guy to to be the it guy for a year or two. You know, like a Conor McGregor was a superstar, but yeah. that's that's about. That's what you're gonna get, you know. The, yeah. the the rest, the rest of the pay per view numbers and shit, the viewership is gonna be what it is. Yeah. Until those guys, until you know, a character comes up that draws from a street boxing or something like me, like I'll go watch Conor McGregor or, or uh, the Ice Man and shit. But yeah. then I'm out. As soon as that's over, I'm out. I'm back. I'm back to where I'm going. So, uh, yeah, it's it's, it's a uh, that's a sport where anything could happen, man. Who the hell knows? What's going yeah, on? you don't know. Exactly. It's, it's not good probability in that MMA to me, which makes yeah. it good. Which makes it yeah. Good. I, I was gonna say that's kind of what makes it exciting though too, because you never know what's gonna happen. Uh, tell me about uh, Michaela, man. I know she was. I know she had to be hot about not being able to perform. Oh man! So that, you know. So you know. She got tested in Houston, where she was for her when she was trained for her camp. Before um, she got tested in uh, Vegas, and it had it, the test hadn't come back yet. So when she got tested in Vegas, that you know that came back positive. But then, like two like the next day or two days later, her Houston test came back negative. You know, okay, but so yeah, she had that time in between that test and traveling to Vegas, she could have caught it. But when she went back to Colorado, she got retested, and that came back negative. So we're pretty sure, like that had to be a false positive because if she was really sick, it would have stayed in her system when she got back to Colorado. So yeah, she was very disappointed. You know, it, it sucks they couldn't do a retest, but it was in the contract with Top Rank and the MGM Grand that they wouldn't do any retests. Um, I know the UFC did retest, but that's because it was in their own facility. Yeah. So that's why they were able to do that. But yeah, so she was very disappointed. It's, it's like. It's so frustrating because she was completely healthy. She was, you know, ready for this fight in great shape. And they tell her, oh, your test came back positive. And you're like, you know, it's a false positive, but you know, but you can't retake it. So, yeah, it was, it was really Thursday annoying. Night. Thursday night on the very next show, uh, two shows later, the, the, the main event got canceled because the guy failed his test and he was in the bubble. So, yeah. Man, that's, it seems like no rhyme or reason. And, and yeah, we was all down there with her. And, and they said, what you call them? Uh, K tested negative. Yeah, yeah, we I were all in the same gym. Oh, yeah, Shakur, Jared, K, and Coach Al, 
you know, coach out Mitchell, her coach, who's 78. So if anything, he's going to be the one to catch it before yep. any of us catch it. And he came back negative. So, yeah. I, it seems like no rhyme or reason with that stuff, man. I, yeah. I don't know. And, and, and I imagine her missing out on the payday, but, but being able to perform the whole thing, man. And <clears throat> the promoters, you know, the, 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 they banking on people to perform on the show for a reason. So I'm sure that threw a monkey wrench into everything. Did they, oh, yeah. did they, did they perform on her show or it just, it wasn't a title or nothing? So, no, it was oh. just, it, it wasn't for, it wasn't They're a just defending another. title. It was They're just, just a, yeah. another fight. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They haven't, they haven't rescheduled it yet? Yeah. I think, I think they rescheduled it for July 14th. Oh, okay. I don't think it's, a couple of weeks. it might be confirmed. Um, They're talking about it, but I think actually it might be confirmed. I got to double check with her. So, so. Listen, Jenny, you're, you're a Houston native. You went to college out to LSU. You traveled the world. Why don't you, uh, how has it been? How has it been dealing with 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 because you 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 documented that you've dealt with the OCD? How has that affected everything that you've been doing? How have you managed that? How can you give encouragement to people out there that are dealing with the same issue and 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 and, and, and are looking for for a way to cope with it? Right. Well, you know, I was diagnosed when I was twelve years old, and that's what I went into inpatient treatment for it. Um, when I was 12 and back then I didn't understand it because OCD, they're still doing a lot of research on it. It's still a very complicated disorder. So I didn't understand it. I think I have a problem. Um, I just thought I like to be more clean than others. I think that was a big deal. And I was able to manage it throughout high school and college at the end of my college years. It started kind of, I could have kind of, I started to feel it like relapsing and me, noticing like okay okay now i'm i see like i see what i'm struggling with and how it's kind of consuming my mind and my behaviors but it really really relapsed hard these past four years mm. during you know the most important time of my life trying to get the olympics so i've been having to deal with that and trying to get to the olympics so um the thing that keeps me motivated though is my boxing. And and I say to this day, if I didn't have boxing, I'm really scared how my life would be or, you know, my foot, where my focus would be. Um, and thanks to my teammates and Michaela, coach K actually, and my parents, you know, they've helped me to, you know, support me and to get the help that I need. So I continue my boxing and continue my focus, but, I deal with it, still deal with it every day. I, last year, I put myself back into inpatient treatment because I got to a point where I always felt like no matter what, I have some hold on it and can continue my life. But back in February of 2019 was the first time in my life, even uh, back, even before I went into treatment back when I was 12 years old was the first time where I literally felt like I had no control over my behavior and that I was just doing my rituals, my OCD rituals, and I couldn't stop. And I felt like I was stuck. And I felt like the only thing that would, that pulled me away from it was my boxing and like, Oh, I got to be at training. But that's the only, that's the only thing that pulled me away. But in between my training, you know, I need to recover. I need to eat. I need to rest. And I wasn't doing any of those things. So that's what was scaring me. And I was like, okay, if I don't do something right now, because all those are part of becoming an Olympian, becoming the best boxer you can, you got to have a balance. And I was like, I know my life isn't balanced right now. And it scared me. So that's why. So I had that time to put myself into impatient. I was like, if I'm going to, if I need, if I'm going to do it now, this is the time because next year is Olympic year. So, and I'm glad I did that because it kind of reset me and put me back on track. Um, to have a better managed uh, managed state on it, but I mean, I'm still struggling with it. To tell them this, the only things I've changed is I'm on medication now, and I'm doing therapy constantly. Where before I was inpatient, I wasn't doing any therapy anymore. I wasn't doing any medication. I was just like, I got this. Yes, it consumes my time, and I'm probably and I'm going through money with all the supplies I use to do my rituals. 
And I was like, but I still have, I, you know, I felt like, felt like I was in one of charge, one the one in charge. But, um, you know, now I feel like it's my OCD and me struggling to get control of, you know, my behaviors in my life. So, I, but I've, I've still done success. You know, I've had so much success in my boxing. I won, you know, I won the Olympic trials. I won silver at Pan Am. So all this in between, in between all that, me showing my OCD, I'm still able to continue my passion, my goal, which is to get the gold. So for, you know, any of you guys that are struggling, like, it's okay to ask for help. And trust me, once you do it, you'll feel it's, it's, it, you'll feel more free. And it's like, cause I used to not want help. I used to not want to be on medication. I used to not believe in it, but you know, I was like, I had to be true to myself. And I was like, okay, you got to, you got to do something because you're spiraling down hill and you don't want this OCD to make you not get the gold medal. And it's all, about, it's all my behaviors that I just had to control my behaviors. You know, you, you, you said it's okay to ask for help. Where would people go? So I know, and that's, that's a hard thing. A lot of people don't know where to go. They don't know. Um, for me, because I was, you know, diagnosed when I was 12. Um, oh, y'all are from Houston. So y'all know Mattress Mac, right? Yeah. So Love his that. daughter. Um, yeah, yeah. He's yeah, a superhero. She actually, huh? He's a superhero. Yeah. 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 So his daughter, I met her in treatment back when I was 12 years old. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, she struggled with it bad. And she actually has her own foundation now called Peace of Mind. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I stayed friends with her all these years. And she's the one I reached out to uh, when I, back last year in 2019 when I was like, you know, I need help again. It's out of control. Like, and she actually, there's this place called Houston OCD. It's the best in the country. And she actually helps run it. And so she got me in there fast because I was like, I don't have much time. Can you help me get in there? Because, you know, they're, they're it's popular. They're booked. Um, so I luckily I had her. But that's kind of why I'm, you know, being open about it and being an advocate. Because people I want people to come to me and be like, right. With any mental health, like, where can you get help? And, and you know, I'll try. You know, you can always do your research. Um, but you know, it's hard to know like which facility or which therapist is the best. So just, I, you know, like reaching out to people, you know, who struggle with the same thing you are going through is the best way to like get help. And if you don't know anybody struggling with it, uh, like I said, just like, like, you know, Google treatment for OCD, treatment for depression, treatment for bipolar, whatever mental health you have and like no. see what pops up. I wanted to bring it up because you 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 just made a point. You know, people don't know where to go. People don't know how to ask for help. And you know, you might think that you don't know somebody, but the likelihood yeah. of you knowing someone that deals with OCD is is, is very high. And you know, we want to make sure that we bring awareness to this, especially now during this time. Uh, specifically during this time, you know, people dealing with the pandemic, being being quarantined. You know, you're dealing with a lot of issues and you're, dealing, you're spending a lot of time alone and that can play with you, that can play with your mind. And so it's important to be open about these topics, discuss them uh, and get comfortable with them because it's a real issue that a lot more people deal with than we would think. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, we applaud you and, and your, your, your testimony to, hey, we all deal with things. You know, one, it, it, not one human's immune from it, but it's not an excuse not to reach your goals and to yeah. and perform at a high level in your right. No, you, yeah, you, you said it right there. So I used to be ashamed of my OCD. Like, that's why I was like, I don't have OCD. Like, I don't want to have this disorder. I don't have a disorder. Yeah. Like, I, you know, I thought it defined me. And so yeah. I used to like hide it. I used to be ashamed of it. But when, you know, when I became part of Team USA and I started rooming with Michaela, you can't, I couldn't really hide it. And so she started asking questions. And so I had to kind of tell her. And uh, then when I started seeing like my teammates and everybody's reaction, like, oh, okay, this is interesting. And they were asking more questions and wanted to learn more about it instead of like judging me or being like, what? You're weird, you know? So when I saw their reaction, I was like, okay, 
maybe I should just tell people this thing I'm struggling with so they can understand me more. And I'm so glad I did that because then I became more comfortable with myself. I was like, okay, this is, this doesn't define me. It's just something I'm dealing with and struggling with. And then it also, you know, when people asking me questions and people trying to understand it, it almost kind of helped me understand why I do what I do more. Cause a lot of times I would just do these rituals and do these behaviors and I wouldn't know why just these, you know, I'd have these thoughts and I would just do them. I wouldn't even think about it, about why I would do them. And that's the frustrating part because if you don't stop and kind of think like, okay, why am I doing this? You're never going to get better. And so being more open about it has actually helped me get better. And that's why I encourage people to don't be ashamed. I know there's a stigma on mental health and OCD, but you know what? That's what I'm trying to stop this stigma. And, you know, don't worry about, about that. Tell people, you know, like, this is what I'm struggling with and blah, blah, blah. And this is why. And people will be, yeah, there's going to be, there's always mean people out there that will not understand and they'll might judge you. But most people out there, because mental health awareness is, is becoming big now. People are starting to understand. And like you said, most people have something that they're dealing with. And that's what you got to realize. You're not the only one. Because when I became open to, there are so many people that say, I struggle with OCD too. I struggle with this. I struggle with this. And I was like, wow, there's, you know, okay, I'm not the only one. There's a, there's, a book, just, real quick. there's a book by Malcolm Gladwell called David and Goliath. I read it uh, a couple of years ago, years ago. And, uh, you know, I have, I have, I deal with this, dyslexia and it's something that I've never talked about. I don't, you know, I, but in that book. That's your problem. Yeah. <laughs> Why you never told me that, man? I did. It all makes sense now. Yeah. I, I, I deal with dyslexia. And, uh, and in the book, it, he says, he, he, he touched on dyslexia and he said, you know, most people look at their at their downfall or their weakness as a deficiency when it's not. It's actually one of your greatest assets because it teaches you to yes. learn things differently. It teaches you to respond to things differently. So while everyone else is doing things one way you're forced to adapt and use different senses, different skills and different ways of learning and achieving. And that puts you at an advantage over someone else because they wouldn't know how to deal with what you're dealing with. But you figured out, you figured out how not to only deal with what you're facing, but also all the normal stuff. And so I think I like we, that. Have, we have to get away from that stigma of, well, I deal with this or that, whether it's dyslexia, whether it's OCD, whether it's an eating disorder, whether it's depression. No, we have to look at it as, wait a minute. If, I, if and when I can overcome this, it actually makes me a stronger person. It puts oh. me at an advantage because I'm learning not only how to deal with life, but learn how to deal with life with this cross that I have to bear, whichever it may be. And if other people see that, then it's going to make them feel like, oh, wait a minute, well, I'm not the only one, A, and B, I'm, there's there's ways to deal with it. So, you know. I like kudos, that, yeah, I like that. Kudos for you being so open about it and, and being a testimony to, uh, to, to, to dealing with it. Yeah, for, we, for sure. Huh? Derek was going to say something. Oh, what yeah. I was going to say, uh, uh, you know, luckily, outside of the problem of uh, being ruggedly handsome, I'm really not, I'm really not affecting them. <laughs> it's, funny how, it's funny how, as people, right, we all, we all uh, try to pretend that, that the issues is, is like we think being brave is acting like they don't exist. Right. Yeah. And when that's the polar opposite of of brave, brave would be uh, admitting and standing down, saying, "Right, I'm fucked up right now. Yeah. I need some help." Yeah. But but humanity, human beings are, are are so used to not exposing them themselves, which is the brave thing to say, "Hey, this is me." This yeah, is my issue, yeah. and I'm not gonna let it stop me. And I imagine, I imagine, uh, uh, 
the anxiety of that adds to whatever issue you have. It's oh, like, he- hell yeah. What do what the hell do I do? Because I, I want to, you know, because everybody is funny. Everybody thinks they're not normal if they have an issue. Where issues is normal. That's normal. Yeah. yeah. You, you ain't, yeah. have an intellect. You have a psyche. You're a human being. So trauma is real. You know, uh, sucking it up. I said this the other day, man. Sucking it up ain't real, bro. That's that's yeah. that's not facing an issue and will cause more damage down the line when you spread it to the next, you know, your your children, your family, rather right. than standing up facing what's going on and and say, I got this issue, man. Right. Well, yeah, yeah. Y'all both put y'all both pretty much said perfect things like like it made it has made me a stronger person today dealing with this <laughs> and and opening up with it. <laughs> you having that part. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm coming over. I'll be right there. <laughs> but but yeah, like and again, when I became open with it, it like took off this weight off of me. It's like I wasn't hiding myself from people. Like I was being true to myself by telling people what I'm struggling with. Like I felt like I was lying to people by not telling them. You know, like you said, like pretending like everything's perfect. It's not. But nobody's perfect, and you got Everybody's got to realize that everybody's dealing with something. It might be different. Everybody might be having something different they're dealing with. But everybody's dealing with something, and definitely, definitely has made me a stronger person because I mean, like the thing, like the the things I have to do with my OCD and boxing. I always tell myself, nobody in the world could have this struggle that I'm dealing with OCD and be in the top level of their game like there's no like even Michaela because Michaela lived you know she's lived with me and seen it she goes she goes I don't know how you do it Jenny I don't know how you deal with your OCD and box like I couldn't do it like she actually said those words and I, you know when she says I'm like oh thank you <laughs> makes me feel better about myself but you know like, it, it's no joke it's it's an issue that I you know that does affect my life and I'm working hard to get it in a manual state where I can you know enjoy my life better but I want to be an example for people who are dealing with what I'm struggling with. And, you know, just let them know, like, again, like I'm saying, you're not alone. And you can still have a successful and happy life. And you just got to be true and honest with yourself. And and you, you can help others by, by, uh, help by telling them what your struggle is. So. We, got, uh, we got another, uh, another uh, viewer question. AB asked, have you ever had a street fight? And then yes, what the heck happened? So actually, no. So before I started, bo- oh, where'd he go? He left. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, no, I, I've i never, besides fighting my older sister, but that's a little different. No, I've never had a street fight. I've never had a, f- I've only fought inside the ring. I've never fought outside the ring. Yeah, that's good. See, AB, yeah. she's a good girl. She ain't out there in the street in the streets fighting, bro. <laughs> I don't let that shit get to me. I'm like, okay, whatever, bye. <laughs> so, so we talked about your past. We talked about your amateur career. We talked about your Olympic career. We're talking about, uh, you know, 2021. The Olympics are going to be coming up. Are you doing anything before? You, you plan on you, you plan on being active before the? Uh, well, I still, so I still have to qualify actually for Tokyo. So this is what happened to me in 2016. So I won the Olympic trials. But then you have to qualify your weight class and country internationally. And that's what I that's where I came short in 2016. So that's the next step that Team USA is doing. So it was supposed to be end of March, beginning of April in Argentina was the continental qualifiers that obviously got canceled. And they're talking about uh, holding it in December or, or January. So that's what I'm preparing for. And we might. You say boxing wants us to have a competition before then, and they're thinking about um, this tournament called the Chemistry Cup in Germany. But again, you know, I don't know if that's going to happen with, you know, all the regulations of traveling overseas and all that. So we'll just see. Uh, Everything's still kind of up in the air. What has been uh, what has been so far your favorite country to visit and fight? Sorry, say that again. Which country has been your favorite country to visit? Oh. <sighs> I think so far Spain 
Because we were in uh, Castellon, Spain. I think I'm saying it right. And it was right there, um, uh, right there on the coast of Spain. And so we were right there on the beach, and there's mountains in the back. It was so pretty. The food was good. It was easy to make weight because you're eating really healthy food. It was just really fun country. And I, I like. I was like, I could retire here. So. Spain's beautiful. Spain, I love Spain. Yeah. Beautiful. So. Once you once you once you go out and you bring this gold back, is that what we're going to start thinking about uh, turning pro? Yep. Yes, sir. That is my plan. And uh, what do you think, Coach? You back with us? What happened? You, yeah. You get you rowdy over there. The <laughs> I fell. I fell all the punt, man. My grandbaby was making two. She made two Thursday, and we're doing a a, a, a party. Party. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> yeah, happy birthday. But uh yeah, my bad. Uh, hey, even the best mess up here once. <laughs> you gotta give me a shot. I so uh, I, we have another viewer question asking if you can roundhouse kick. What is it? We got some MMA fans today. Uh, well, I'm sure I can. I've never really tried though. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> How's this whole quarantine? Uh, have you been Have you been playing it safe? Have you been going out? Which Which side of the Which side of the? Um, the I mean, I've been playing it safe for the most part. Me and Michaela did some traveling, but we were, you know, we we're very self conscious when we traveled. Every time we'd stop to get gas or go to the bathroom, we would Lysol um, yeah. everything that went in the store, and then Lysol our hands. Um, uh, we the reason why we traveled, like we traveled Washington D.C. and then to Houston, was to find training because nothing was open in Colorado Springs. So we went to Washington D.C. because Coach K had his gym and it was safe there. He only had like three of us in the gym at a time. And then when Michaela got the call to fight, they did the camp in Houston. And then I'm from Houston, so I just uh, came home to my family and I was you know safe with my family. And every time we went to the gym, you know they take your temperature and. Right. Every, you know, they do the right precautions. So, um, and actually, honestly, I feel more comfortable going to the store now because every, they disinfect all everything. They disinfect the counters, the carts. So I actually feel more comfortable going to the store in this time than I did before. And so it's kind of funny. Everybody asks that. They're like, how are you, how are you dealing with it? I'm like, well, you know, people are kind of living in my world right now. So yeah. I'm a little more, you know, a little more comfortable. Yeah, now, it, it has affected me. Huh? I say the OCD plays to your advantage. Right? I know. I'm like, <laughs> have I been doing everything the right way? And now everybody's catching on? Exactly. <laughs> what, have, uh, what have you found yourself? What have you found yourself eating, like in, in, in what have you found yourself eating more of during this quarantine? Because the right word limited. Is there something that you catch yourself eating and be like, yeah, I've been, I've been eating a lot of this? Actually, no. No. Um, I are pretty. You cooking, eat, are you cooking I, or are you going out to eat? No, no, no. So, you know, I stayed with Michaela for most of this part and she, she does all the cooking. I like that. That's why, you know, that's why I say her. No, she's a good cook. So, and, you know, we always we eat. We always we always like a balanced, well balanced meal, and and we always been good with that, whether we're in camp or out of camp. Um, so yeah, I mean that really hasn't changed, honestly. Like our eating habits. One of the, one of the things in, 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 this, in this household that I've seen, we've gone through, like we've gone through so many cases of water. I don't, I don't think I've ever drank this uh. much. Water. I don't know what the deal is with that, but. Oh man, hey, well, it was. What do you think, Coach? They got you moving around in the garage. Oh man, they go. I gotta take my Berlin pot and get some crawfish going and all Ooh. kind of stuff. Man. Okay, but, no, I'm uh, definitely coming over. <laughs> are, you, uh, are you at home right now, Jim? You in? Houston? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm in Houston. Yeah, yeah. We uh, yeah, we gonna do it big over here. Got a splash and and, and big water slide and stuff. So how much crawfish? How many pounds? We got three sacks because uh, uh, we got a few people coming. I mean, we still supposed to be quarantining, but yeah, it's just close. You know, just a few close people that have been coming to the house anyway. <laughs> right. Right. But uh, yeah, man, I'm glad you came on here for and it, it and of and, and and you didn't go Hollywood. Um, I asked <laughs> you, you were like, yeah, hey, go, let's go. 
<laughs> no, no, any, no, anytime. Come on, come on. I got you guys. Yeah, this is fun. Hey, uh, we got you know Quentin signed with that new management. He's in Miami right now, sparring. Yeah, with, uh, I saw that. Yeah, he he sparring with some good guys out there, and he's having a blast right now in Miami. He'll be back this week though. Hopefully, okay. some, hopefully we get a date soon too, and I'll post it. Okay, cool. But, uh, yeah, I appreciate you coming on, and and and. Of course, guys. And yeah, hopefully, uh, after we win that gold medal, you'll come back. Yes, so we can brag publicly, you know. Yeah, let's do it. Make some crawfish too. I do it. I, that's yeah. what I do. <laughs> you, I'm really down. Too. We appreciate y'all tuning in. We have Miss Jenny, Houston native, graduate of uh, uh, LSU. Hey, uh, and I wanted to, man, I wanted well, to say uh, sorry to uh, Earl Spence because Jenny took all his time. We can't, you know, we'll have y'all next time, brother. I'm sorry. Girl friends is in the back green room. He was waiting to come on, come on live. We apologize. My bad. All right, y'all. We appreciate you coming in. Good luck with the trials, and uh, we'll keep us posted. Anytime you want to come back on, we'd love to have you on. I'd love to come back. Yeah, guys. Anytime. Okay, keep in touch for sure. See you later, baby. All right, bye, y'all. Bye.